guys here too. Hi. Is everyone Hi. having a great time today? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, right, I'll make, I'll us... make, uh, sorry, I have to go. I'll make, I can join you later. I'll make. I'll make. Roger, I Miko. Thank you. I'll, I'll see you around, buddy. See you around. Salut, mon pot. See you later, All right, Stuji, tell us a little bit training 104th training and the difference from before and after a bit. Yeah, certainly. Uh, well, before I uh, joined 104th, well, I, I had flown, you know, pretty much solo for a really long time. So I was I was really so solo oriented, and I I had this kind of um, aggressive style. I took a lot of risks. Well, I kind of still do, but anyway. So my, you know, my. My style was completely not um, compatible with <laughs> any level of teamwork, uh, you know. So, once I got into the training, it, it pretty much, like, put me in my place, so to speak. So, you know, I got much more disciplined, especially, you know, when it's necessary, like, uh, when you fly in public events, this kind of, um, where you only can die once, of course, you can't, you can't take stupid risks. And I took a lot of stupid risks in the past, so they kind of ironed that out, so I don't die uh, in a stupid way. And of course, uh, when it comes to teamwork, you know, I was pretty new to teamwork, to be honest, before, before joining 104th. So, so the training gave me a lot, lot with that. Yeah, M molded me, you know. And it's better. a difficult part too, because <clears throat> think think of it or not, you know, communicating correctly and even getting used to the fact that when you fly out there, you fly on TeamSpeak and you fly with people on blue side or you rally people to get with you on TeamSpeak and then basically try to fly together in a coordinated style. That only works if you speak a lot, if you know what you have to say. And if you can also react to what others say, because that increases, and that is something which is the most important thing when we fly, but it's your situational awareness, okay, which we call SA shortly. And your SA not only consists of what you see on the radar, what you see on the radar warning receiver, uh, radar warning system, the RWS, uh, what you see outside of the window, the tones that the aircraft is giving to you, as a feedback, the beeping, the missile warning, the lock tone, and so on, the pull up, um, altitude, um, low fuel, whatever that, everything of that goes into your SA. But what increases, doubles, quadruples, triples, gazillionuples, this is if you have teammates who communicate what they see, because your brain while it is still processing all those inputs right what you see in the aircraft and that is and that is the true skill to master is basically to calm your brain down enough to be able to process that information okay and then make a decision based upon it and what you get from your wingman or from the buddies that are flying with you is already processed information that means information that has been already digested in a way so that you can quickly and much quicker react to it as to the information that you're still processing yourself, okay? So this is something which increase your situ increases your situational awareness tremendously. And the pilot which always wins and which comes out on top is always the pilot with the best situational awareness because the bigger your situational awareness, the more time you will have to come up with a battle plan or a strike plan or whatever you want, react to the situation, adapt and uh, then basically, um, you know, um, uh, fulfill your tactic successfully. Um, if you have any questions, guys, okay, ask ask ahead, um, um, and 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 I will answer. If you don't understand anything what I'm talking about, just ask me or Stooge, and 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 we will answer everything, okay. So situational awareness, that is the ability of knowing really what happens around you, okay? And the one thing you need for that in order to really get good in, um, the one thing you really need to get good with that in uh, DCS, that is TACView. Okay, in TACView, that is a program that is basically 
like an AVAX view on the battle situation that records your flight or you can generate it from a track if you fly on a server and you can basically see and stop it and pause it and select a single missile you can select the aircraft because at the beginning the most difficult thing is to understand what is really happening around you that means how is that missile really flying why did it get me again uh, how much speed does it have did I did I break for defense too early or too late um, did I pull too hard on my stick oh this is why I lose you see the the G spike in in tag view you have all the telemetric data of the missile and of your aircraft of your opponent's aircraft you have all that and then when you see that this this the G is spiking hard when you were pulling into the split ass for the defensive maneuver and then you lost your speed and then that missile was still strong enough although you started early enough to get you is then you know this was my mistake at this exact moment and you will see visually how the missile is flying how the missile is chasing you how the missile is trying to put a to pull a lead uh, pursuit on you and how you can react better to that if you see i was too slow i was too fast stuff like that this makes you better and also you can observe how other people are flying okay nobody of us neither stooge nor me nor maverick nor riptide or whoever you pick from the one or fourth or frosty or all the good pilots that are out there from the other squadrons uh, rooster gg and whoever they called okay all those people they always had somebody who showed them and somebody who they could see how they have been doing it you know nobody has been pioneering this this stuff and what we did basically is we take real life military aircraft tactics as much as we can get our hands on you can read books from pilots you know you find a lot of in there like uh, uh, autobiographies by pilots or battle reports by pilots that have been declassified and then you take that and then you adapt that to the game and that is also something you have to understand okay well we don't try to be like real life pilots like the real military we don't try to fly like them okay we try to take from them what's good and what works in DCS and then add the stuff that we think makes us develop an, uh, uh, successful with how the, the game has developed in the recent years because for example the AIM-120 has become way less powerful it's not as long you know we were killing people at 40 nautical miles in Fleming Cliffs too that's never gonna happen with the AIM-120 today so when we do the basic cranking maneuver which we will show you later um, you know, you cannot make the full gimbal shot from 20 nautical miles. That missile will never reach the opponent. To adapt to these situations, you have to know, okay, man, an effective range of the AIM-120 now is really somewhere around 8 nautical miles, okay? I have to find a way to fly and defend myself in the meantime to get close enough to the bandit to shoot that missile so that it is effective enough that I can kill him, okay? And that's the whole job, basically, when, you, when you're flying is to to think how you can adapt to the situation because whenever you will have a question like how is that like standardized what do I do if this happens you know the the answer is so often it depends because all these situations there are so many and that's why air to air um, in in DCS for me personally is so much more fun than it is uh, doing air to ground which is great fun uh, as well I don't want to bash any strikers we have tremendously great pilots in the community uh, in air to ground but for me the great thing with air to air is that every single time you go out there it's different the new situation it's a new opponent and of course the longer you fly the more you know the people on the server the more you know how you react to them the more you know how they normally behave and you can start abusing that but that's also already the next level thing okay first you have to get yourself in fact to a certain situation where you can simply adapt and react to what's happening around you because at the beginning everything every single time will basically be new okay any questions so far yeah do you run tack view on your servers now no it's off because of the integrity check and the export lure what you can do okay is that after 30 minutes or 45 minutes something like that you exit the server and you just save the track and then when you replay the track and don't replay it with more than two times speed um you can create the Acme file for the tag view from that track. It's oh, a little okay. bit of a hassle, but that still works and it's very, it's, 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 it's a very effective way on really understanding like 
hey man, the guy was sneaking around the valley, that's why he found me, you know. And I never cared to look there because I was too lazy, you know. But he got me in my ass because, you know, I wasn't looking. And in tech view, you see, oh man, that's happening around me all the time. I never had a clue, you know. And then the next time you already know, okay, I got to look there and there as well with my radar. Because the more active you are as a pilot, the more success you will have uh, on the server, okay? Yeah, Any more questions? questions? Yeah, I no? can just say, yeah, about the tech view. You know, so often I hear people, you know, going on in the team speak, like they get killed and they're like, how the fuck is that possible? Or like, yeah, sorry about the swearing anyway. How is that possible? <laughs> how did he kill me? You know, that that's impossible, you know, and, and he must be cheating or whatever. And all they should do is open the, you know, replay, uh, as Iron Mike said, you know, replay the uh, the flight, watch the tech view, and then you see what happened, right? And usually, you know, 99% of the cases, there is an explanation why you get killed, and then you'll And on it. top of that, in 99% of all cases, it's your mistake, always. If you get, and, and that's the cruel part about DCS and flying air to air, okay? You have to have a lot of setbacks and a lot of dying and being shot on and ejecting and not making it home to the airbase in order to learn. But if you do not check with TACVIEW or somebody who was around or at least the replay, you know, uh, what happened, you will not be able to learn. And that's what TACVIEW is there for, okay? Do not mind getting shot down. I remember very well how frustrated I was for the first time. I think one and a half years, excuse me, I think for the first one and a half years in DCS, I have been flying only air to ground. Then air to ground gets success quick, okay, you see the tank blowing up, um, those units, they shoot back at you, but not as relentlessly as the air to air side does, and especially the battle pilots, they don't care if you're a noob or not, they're going to shoot you down, that's the job. And, you know, those tanks are sitting there, and then the fifth and the sixth and the tenth time, you fly that mission, you know already that tank is here, that Strela is there, you know, and you develop a flow, and that's a very, very good step. Because what you do, you repeat these areas because they give you success and they give you joy, okay? What you start developing is a workflow and a routine. And that is also what you need to develop for air-to-air -air if you want to be successful in air-to-air, -air, is a workflow and is a routine. And I would suggest that, that we stop talking and we, we start looking a bit for the workflow. And I would suggest that we start with the most powerful weapon of the F-15, and that is the radar, okay? Um, the server is online. It is called 104th Public uh, Training, I think. And the password is Eagle. Like this, simple and with small letters. Any questions so far? Is it fast? Is, is it too much? Is it understandable? Is it is it going okay for you guys? Yeah, fine. It's fine, yeah. Okay, cool. Is there anybody here who does not know how to use the sub modes of the F-15? Uh, I'm not overly confident on them. Okay, but you know that there are sub modes and that the radar has special uh, sub modes that you can use in certain situations. Yes. Good. Good. Me too. Good. 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 So, what's the server called now? It's called uh, One or Fourth Public Training. And then you will see on the blue side F15 ramp. Just choose one of these and spawn in. I'm only getting the normal 104th Phoenix dedicated at the moment. I'm pretty sure it's uh, it's there because everybody else saw it too and could join. Yeah, yeah. I'm refreshing the list. There's about eight people in here, I think, at the moment. Yeah. Cool. 
Got it. Got it, great. Sorry, can you repeat the password? It's eagle, with small letters. Like the bird eagle. Thank you. Oh, you're using the black skins. Some are, some are not, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't. take too much uh, care about details, it's just about the... Uh, um, um, functionality of the cockpit for us to see. We will not take off with these ones. For the little air exercise, we will have air start F-15s. Okay. Here we will just look at the cockpit. Um, does is anybody here who is not familiar with the F-15 cockpit, like at all? Who doesn't know where speed is and altitude and what the fuck all these gauges are? Like I don't know what I'm staring at. No, that's good. Okay, then uh, light up your cockpit, engage the uh, um, the power. We didn't. We don't need to spool up. Okay, power is simply right shift L. And then to see better, you can also turn on your cockpit lights, but you don't have to. Okay, first of all, let's have a look at the pack. That's the MFD on the left with the weapons. This is the standard 104th loadout that we take, okay, for all the server missions. You don't need three tanks. Three tanks, they let you travel... They let you travel fast, uh, further, not faster. You travel much slower, but you travel further. The problem being is that when you pickle the tanks, you can pickle only the outer two ones and not the middle one, okay? So you will be left with less fuel at the moment that you pickle anyway. Um, that extra range that you get, okay, you don't need it. Um, because once you're far enough with your skills and, and, and the confidence on how to drive the aircraft, you will be able to fight with two fuel tanks, okay? Two fuel tanks can stay on and you're still fight effective, okay? If you, uh, if you want to make sure though, however, whenever you enter a fight and you should do that at the beginning, you pickle your tanks, okay? Um, which is uh, left alt R uh, for pickling the tanks and you should do that 20 nautical miles from your bandit. That's most uh, Air Force's standard range or I don't know, I mean, actually, we don't care what any Air Force's standard range is. In game, 20 nautical miles for pickling tanks is good. So, apart from that, you have six slammers, 120 Cs, and then you have two AIM 7s, uh, semi active missiles, which is sometimes very good in flood mode and um, uh, uh, similar sub modes uh, for uh, VVR attacks, okay? Yeah. And of course, in the restricted missions, you only will get AIM 7s and AIM 9s. Um, uh, a different standard loader that we have is that we replace the AIM-7s with AIM-9s. That is uh, mostly when we fight in mountainous regions, uh, when you get dragged down and you're in a, a close corner fight uh, within the valley or something like that, then the AIM-9 will be much more of use to you in those VVR engagements than the AIM-7. The AIM-120C, of course, being the standard weapon of the um, uh, Eagle, and the biggest uh, benefit that the AIM-120 brings us is that it is after you guide it to Pitbull, okay, uh, not before, but once you've guided it to Pitbull, it is a fire and forget missile. That means you can turn away and start running away from the missile that's coming at you, while an SU-27 or an SU-33 or any other aircraft with semi-active missiles will still have to keep lock on you in order to kill you. Anything you did not understand of that, please ask so far, so good. Okay. Then I will with, show. Sorry, go ahead. With with the tanks, I've noticed many times in the past. I'm trying to get rid of them, and it won't release. Uh, what's the parameters? You have to fly level and straight. Is it, you can I mean, be in a to... slight climb, and you can be in a slight dive. But if you're banked, left or right, you cannot pickle your tanks. Okay. Okay, so that's. Or if you're pulling G's or anything like that, it won't let you pickle the tanks. You have to basically be in a, 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 a around 1G and level. Okay, then I will show you how to um, 
turn on the radar. Does everybody know how to interpret the HUD so far? On the right you have the altitude, on the left you have the speed. Okay, then you have your um, your artificial horizon. Uh, the aircraft in the middle is being presented by um, by a back view. You have the the fin on the top and the, the wings, and then you have the W. That's your nose in nose point indicator, um, which is not your flight path indicator. Okay, if you would have a high angle of attack and fly low, as uh, low, and you would try to cover go over a, a mountain. If the circly thing is pointing at the mountain, you will crash into it even if the W, the nose, is pointing above it because you will have a down drift through to your high angle of attack and low speed. Okay, So if you want to clear that mountain, that circly thing has to point above the mountain. That's your flight path indicator. Okay, And wherever that is showing, you are flying. Okay, um, However, if you fire missiles, and that's important. Um, you have to uh, um, you have to fire the missile on the uh, shit. Now I forgot the man. What's what's the name, Stooge? The the leading point, the guiding point of the missile. The little the dot on the HUD. I don't know its name. Uh, Steer come on. A steering. What? Steering dot. Uh, I'm not sure. Guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the the leading vector of the missile is represented by a dot which is the shooting point okay and you have to center that on the w in order to make the aim 120 or the aim 9 or the aim 7 a successful shot a lot of people don't do that they fire it off um off uh, come on I, I need to know what the point is we're back i was already reading the the flight manual I think it's steering. Uh, Jesus, steering I'm so stupid. It's shoot cue, okay? That's the oh, shoot cue yeah. we call that. Sorry, guys. So you have to put the shoot cue on that W because the missiles in DCS, they have waypoints set out in order to follow a lead course on the bandit. And waypoint one is the waypoint the missile will always turn towards first. So the more off of that waypoint it is, and that's actually your shoot cue pointing towards that waypoint, okay? more off of that waypoint it is, the more G's it will pull at the beginning and the more speed it will bleed, which means it will become slower and have less probability to hit the target, understand? That's something new, I never knew that. Well, good. good to tell you, so whatever you do, M9s, M7s, always try to pull that lead so that you can bring the shoot cue on the W and then you will have Now let's turn on the radar and to do that uh, That's a little bit of an exploit. I don't know if that um, works in real life, but uh, let's press, press 3 for the sub mode vertical scan. And you see that the radar comes alive and at the same time in the hut you see one of the most important sub modes apart from the normal radar mode which is the sub uh, sub mode vertical scan you see a line pointing up from the nose in the hut and um, you also see that you have an R max and an R min range for the aim 120c represented within that line if you would lock that that would uh, line up with your target then in the radar scale on the left on the MFT but that's not so much important what's important is that this radar is in a 10 degree angle, left and right, pointing upwards from your nose. So whatever comes within those 10 degrees going up from your nose within, let's say, about 10 miles to be sure, okay, will get locked up automatically. This is very important when you're in a very close fight with bandits because one thing your radar cannot do is easily detect um, bandits that are very close to you because the closer you're looking with the radar, okay, the less space it covers and most of the stuff is happening around it. That's why so many people will say, I didn't see him on the radar. To understand that, it, did everybody of you bring that piece of paper? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. 
so take that piece of paper and just fold it in the middle, okay, so that, you know, you have Dyna 4, you fold on Dyna 5, okay? So that if you open it a bit and you look from the side, it looks like a crocodile mouth, okay? Everybody has that? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Now, hold the right, hold the hold the piece of paper in front of you, so that the open side of the mouth is pointing away from you, and the the V, uh, uh, the, the the top is pointing towards you. Got that? Yep. Okay. Now, if you would cut. 60 degree angle from the middle to the left and to the right away everything which is between the upper and the lower sheet of that paper is what you see in the radar okay and then when you look at it from the side and you open it let's say like you open it so that it that at the end there's like your pointer in between or one finger okay so that it's open like i don't know 10 centimeters at the end you see let's say that is the range of 20 nautical miles in the radar that you're looking at okay the whole paper is long 20 nautical miles and it's open in between 5 and 15 thousand feet okay because you can set uh, the altitude in your radar then everything which is outside that piece of paper is not visible for you okay only which is within is visible for you so if you would put a pen within that paper you would see the pen if you put that pen outside of the paper up or down you will not see the pen but the radar is telling you okay you're looking 20 nautical miles ahead between 5,000 and 15,000 feet now that bandit is 10 miles in front of you at 15,000 feet will you see him or not Anyone? He's going to be outside. Exactly. So halfway between those 20 nautical miles where the radar is indicating for you that you're looking at 50,000 feet, the bandit will be 10 miles away from you and he will be at 15,000 feet, but you will not see him because as you see from the piece of the paper, okay, at this moment it is too closed and the bandit is stripped simply outside. Now what you have to do in this situation you will have to move the scan zone up if you just tilt your hand backwards and you move the radar up you will see this bandit now or the, the pen that you're holding or the finger that you're putting in between suddenly will be within the paper at the same time and at the expense that everything below that okay now will not be visible anymore so if there was a bandit five miles ahead of you who was at let's say 2,000 feet you will not see him at all understand Yep, got it. Okay, let's have a look now how this looks in the MFD. Now press 2. And now you will see in the MFD that we'll have the radar uh, running from left to right, scanning at 10 nautical miles. And the range is 0, 0. That is always when you switch from vertical scan, okay, the radar will switch back to that. So. If you want to switch back to normal radar usage because you know the bandit is a little bit further and the vertical scan didn't work, um, always be prepared that you have to change it back. We will put the range now to 80 nautical miles. This is the two digit number on the right side, on the upper right side. And you see that while the radar is scanning from left to right, 60 degrees left and 60 degrees to the right, it is switching on the left bottom between high and medium and you also see the four line search that is doing on the left side which is how long it takes to cover the range that is showing if you have not changed anything except the range the radar should show something between 0 and 21 nautical miles and the TDC should be in the middle is everybody has the radar set like that yep. yes yes, yes. Yep. Good. Now, since 80 nautical miles is the furthest away in this setting, and the bottom line is basically a false representation of our nose, okay? Um, the second line from the top is 60 nautical miles. 
the third line is 40 nautical miles, that's where our TDC is, is set at. The fourth line is uh, 20 nautical miles in this case, and the bottom line, of course, is zero miles or our nose. Now, why is it a false representation of our nose? Because the lines, if you take the, the horizontal line running from top to bottom in the middle, and the one left and, and right of it, the one left and right of it, they're actually going away from our nose in a 30 degree angle. If anybody was sitting in the Mirage and had the radar of the Mirage on, there it is an actual representation. While this is a false one because even if they run straight, you have to think that these lines are running in a 30 degree and the most outer lines on the left and the right in a 60 degree angle. Understand? Yeah, yes. Got it, got it. That means that if a target is running down the line, on the line, it is on a collision course because the, the, uh, the bearing on the target actually is staying the same. And if you keep the speed and it keeps running down that line, you will collide with the target. Understand? Yes. yes. Yep. Good. Now, the TDC, as you see, is set exactly at 40 nautical miles. There is a function which is center the TDC. So whenever you have been fooling around with the radar too much and you think, oh man, that, that guy just must have just must be right in front of me, because sometimes even that is the case, you know. You search high, you search low, you search left, you search right, but the fucker is simply in front of you. And that's the last you were thinking about, but you know, often it is like that. So you you put center and then at this moment you see that the radar basically is telling you you are looking forty nautical miles ahead between 0 and 21,000 feet or 20,000 or how much is represented on the left. Okay, now let's leave the TDC at the middle, but let's let's uh, bring the angels up on the left side. And let's scan between 60 and 20,000. So you, you, you change the altitude on the left side so that on the top it is 60 and on the bottom it is 20,000. Yep. Everybody set? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Firm. Good. Now, slew the TDC to the 20 nautical mile line, that is the first line from the bottom. And you will see the altitude that you would see at 20 nautical miles, when you're looking at 40 nautical miles between 20 and 60,000, actually you will only see between 11 and 33,000. And now slew the TDC all the way back to your nose. And you will see that basically it doesn't represent anything anymore because it just it, it is so thin now that it only looks really right in front of you. And uh, at that moment, you're basically merged with a bandit, and whatever you see in the radar is already yesterday. Understand? Yeah, you also yeah. see that once you smooth that TDC further and further down, the range on the right side, on the upside, adjusted itself uh, by itself. Okay? Yep. Yeah. Good. Now let's go back to 18 nautical miles. And you see that we are now in the interleaf frequency. The interleaf frequency is a frequency we use very rarely. I will tell you about it at the end. The one frequency that we use most of the time is for anything in between 20 and 80 nautical miles, which is high PRF. Okay? So change it to high so that when it scans on the bottom on the left, it says it high. High frequency is used for any head-on aspect bandits that are further away than 22 nautical miles, okay? Once so how, how do you change that? Sorry, because one keeps switching between medium and high. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. I had it in the Facebook post. I didn't remember because I have it mapped when I was looking it up. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. Anybody it, knows? It's right shift and I. Right shift and I. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And the frequencies always followed 
by interleaf when you turn the radar on, high, medium, next, interleaf, high, medium, interleaf, high, medium, okay? And remember which frequency you chose because when you go into TWS, which we will do next, you will not see what frequency you're in anymore. So it's good to remember that you do not have to go out of TWS because if you have a bandit locked in TWS and you exit TWS, you do not actually unlock the bandit before it will go into STT automatically, which you might or might not want to avoid. So basically, always try to remember in what frequency you're on. And for any bandit that is head aspect, okay, and further away than 22 nautical miles, we always use high PRF frequency. For every bandit that is below 22 nautical miles, we use medium PRF. Medium PRF we also use from bandits that are going out that are cold. Okay, hot always means the nose of the bandit is pointing towards us and is approaching us. And cold always means that the nose of the aircraft is uh, pointing away from us and flying away from us. Notching means that he's in a 90 degree left to right or right to left cross path in front of our nose. And then flanking would mean that he's flying on either our right or left. Uh, most of the time the same course that we are flying, that's flanking. But the most important is, is the bandit hot or is it cold or is he notching? Those are the three things that interest us. For hot, above 22 nautical miles, again, high PRF. And for anything um, uh, below 22 nautical miles, always medium PRF. Um, why? I don't know. It just works. That's my answer, okay? <laughs> uh, interleaf is something you can use sometimes against choppers. It works better than medium. Sometimes choppers, okay, if you're chasing KE50s or something within 20 nautical miles, high works better. This is like experimental shit, you know? When you're chasing a KE50 or something, you never know. And sometimes it picks him up in medium, sometimes it picks him up in high, sometimes in interleaf. What I use interleaf for is if somebody is notching further away than 22 nautical miles, but closer than 42 nautical miles, or beaming Beaming is a little bit less strict notch, which still means that he's trying to put me on his 9 or 3 o'clock. Um, so this is something where I use interleaf. Other than that, I find very, very rarely uh, um, use for interleaf. Medium and high, those are the two modes I prefer to use. Any questions at this point? No. 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 No, all good. So... As you see, the radar is scanning left, right, left, right. And every six these traverses it makes, it updates. Usually it detects targets quicker, but especially if they're in a notchy, beamy situation, very low, cold aspect or something, it takes the full six seconds to recognize or also lose the target on the radar. So whenever you change a setting, for example, a standard pattern that I would fly, okay, I take off and let's say I'm just scanning in STT for now, okay, to make it a bit easier. I would start scanning between 0 and 33,000 at 60 nautical miles and I would at least wait 12 seconds in that mode because 6 seconds I need to get an update then all fighter aircraft are not visible beyond 60 nautical miles. So while I'm flying there, it could be that somebody just enters this 60 nautical miles range and I detect him afterwards. So this is always, I take 12, 18, maybe 24 seconds on that before I start scanning anything else. I'm still far away from, from bullseye. So the threat level of low flying close bandits at this moment is still very low. I can concentrate on the far picture. Uh, the next scan I would do is I would pull back the TDC to 40 nautical miles and at the same time I would raise the level between 20 and 60,000 which means that at this moment I would still be scanning around 40,000 at 60 nautical miles. Okay, at this moment I'm still not interested who is at 40 nautical miles. I'm still looking at 60 and I'm looking up. 
Then I would move it back to about 58 miles. And again, I would wait six seconds here. And I would scan between 0 and 10,000 and then 0 and 5,000, two times six seconds. That around would cover around that 60 miles area pretty nicely. If I haven't detected anyone there, but I have nails, and we're not far on the two TWS, uh, but close to the middle, then I know those guys are closer. Okay, so I need to start commencing the pattern at miles and repeat the same thing then around 20 and maybe even 10 nautical miles because the more I approach uh, through that search process, bullseye or the FIBA, frontline, whatever you want, or your cap station, the more, of course, the, the low level threat rises and the more you have to be aware uh, that there might be sneaky bandits while you have been scanning the long range. If you remember the, the, uh, the paper that you had in your hands, no matter what you will be scanning at long range, anything closer than half of that will be already outside of that scan zone. Any questions? No. Nope. And it is quite, you know, exhausting uh, sometimes because if you want to be successful with the radar, you have to work it a lot. Okay, you cannot just turn the radar on, look at 14 nautical miles between 0 and 20,000 and expect you will see what's happening there. Uh, the other threat that's always okay, if you have nails and you don't see that bandit, okay, he's either very far away and you don't have to worry about him, but if you look at the TWS on the right side, okay, and you see the, the o'clock dots, like 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, okay, if you draw a line between 10 and 2 o'clock, that is, depending on the emitting radar, always somewhere around 40 to 50 mile-ish, okay? So any twos contact that you will have, and that's only for airborne contact, okay? Outside of that line, that's basically far, and everything within that line is basically medium range, and everything which is very close to the middle, this is uh, close range, okay? Because the twos in the F-15 is a wrong representation of the twos. Normally the twos prioritizes high threats. That means a bandit is locking you up or uh, that is a stronger opponent or whatever that will be placed more into the middle. And those lower threats who are not locking you up or who are not emitting strong or whatever, uh, searching in your directions, they will be placed further outside. But in the F-15 you can determine ranges with that, okay? And that is very important to take that in to your SA as well. So if you see that guy is somewhere around 40, 50 nautical miles and I don't see him anywhere, okay? Normally he's either very high or very low. And uh, what we call up, uh, up high is uh, the danger zone and what we call down low is in the weeds. So always try to scan. If you go to 20 nautical miles, on your radar please and you put it to medium PRF because at 20 and below 20 we're always at medium and then try to scan between 30 and 45,000 you will see how difficult that is and if you pull the TDC even closer that becomes even less okay so in this case, if you haven't found him by yet, by 10 nautical miles and you know he's just close, either you're brave and you switch to vertical scan, if you know running is futile or whatever, or basically what I would do at this moment, because playing it safe is always playing it better, uh, I would extend and uh, uh, once I would know that I'm safe, I would try to recommit, but uh, often, you know, on the server why not try out stuff you know it doesn't cost anything you get shut down okay but you might learn something so from time to time try to switch to that uh, vertical scan and then slightly rock your aircraft from the left to the right and you will cover more space because those 10 degrees will be like a wind wiper swapping from left to right and covering more of the sky so you have a bigger probability to lock up the bandit and once you've merged of course low level eights with a swapping attitude will also help you to lock up the bandit. Understand? Any questions? Nope. 
Okay, let's look at the last thing in the radar and that is TWS. Is everybody in TWS? Yes. Yep. Good. TWS is the track while scan mode. So what does it mean when I lock a bandit? When I lock a bandit, that basically means that um, the radar beam or the beam that the radar is emitting is focused on that bandit, okay, solely. And that means basically I've locked the bandit. The bandit will detect that and that then sounds like a lock in his radar warning receiver because the, the, the radar energy, the beam of the radar is so strong that, that the receiver will detect that and that the radar will be able to follow that bandit through more radar evasive maneuvers like notching and stuff as well. You might still lose a bandit in a notch if he's notching you lower, even in an STT lock. TWS is different in that aspect that only a part of the radar beam is emitted to the bandit. And in order to be able to also see stuff around the bandit, TWS is reduced to a 30 degree left and 30 degree right scan. Okay. And now, if you see, if you move the TDC from left to right, you see that the scan zone is moving with you. So if you have been defensive and you're recommitting, that means turning back in on the bandit. So if you're recommitting on the bandit over your right side, you will, through that recommit, already want to set up the radar correctly. You know he's at 10,000 feet, about 15 miles away. So I set it to 20 nautical miles and make sure that it scans in between that altitude. And I will slew in TWS the radar all the way to the right so that the first thing when the radar hits him, he will appear on my radar screen because I've already set it to that direction. It would be stupid, of course, to set it to the left side because it would take you two times longer to see the bandit. Understand? Yep. yep. So thinking ahead how you set up the radar through your flight is also crucial in success because TWS is the one you want to be in with it with the F-15. First of all, you have way more SA. Once the SC-27 locks you up, it doesn't see anything else anymore except on the Berliosa. You, however, in the F-15 will be able to see everything which is happening about 60 degrees around that bandit. So either, even 60 degrees left and 60 degrees right. So if you're moving it left from right, it will always stop at the edges once you have locked up a bandit. You can see the, the whole 120 degrees. And if you have a two, three, or four ship, you can lock up to four targets simultaneously. And with the AIM-120C, you can fire onto four targets simultaneously. If you would have eight missiles, eight 120s, you could basically fire eight missiles on a four ship of, um, of whatever you're up against. So this is a huge advantage in the F-15C. With an F-15C, I will be more likely to engage an enemy two-ship than being alone in an SA-27. I will always try to separate them in a certain way and, and then pick them up one by one, but I would not dare going against two because what they will do against me is a very basic maneuver that you call bag and drag. One guy plays the bait and the other one snaps and shoots you down. Understand? Yep. Yep. Yes. If you lock a target in TWS and you lock him again, it snaps automatically into STT. If you have a high maneuvering target, especially way lower than you, and within 20 nautical miles, often it is better to switch to STT to maintain the lock because the bandit can break your lock much easier in TWS. Understand? Sorry, below what mileage was that? In TWS, the lock is not as stable as in STT. And yeah. the, the F-15 F radar, sometimes within 20 nautical miles, when you're looking down, has, um, uh, has problems to keep lock because of the ground clutter. So in this case, if you're at, let's say, I'm at 40,000 feet, and you're 18 nautical miles ahead of me, and you're at 5,000 feet, I will lock you STT, 
and I will descend so that my nose is pointing at you in order to support my radar with everything that I got to keep that lock so that I'm able to engage you. Understand? Yep, got it. Yep. Okay. I will show you another sub mode. Uh, if you press 4, that is bore side mode, and you see a little circle in the inner circle. And any bandit within about 10 nautical miles that would fly through that circle will be locked up immediately. So sometimes if a bandit is low head to head with you, let's say in a valley, and suddenly he's not on the radar anymore, that's just because the cone has become so thin he's too close, you can't work with that anymore. Quickly switch to, to, to sub mode 4, bore sight scan, and the radar will lock the target up automatically and you can immediately fire your missile. Any questions? Nope. The is next there mode any is range six. limit to using Gorsight mode? Say again? Is there any range limit to using Gorsight mode? Is it limited to like around 10 miles? About 10, 10 nautical miles. All the sub modes, okay. okay. Um, except for the for 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 the aim 120 c which is the next one that is sub mode 6. And I want you got that? Yeah, no, sorry, your mic went quiet. Yeah, you cut off there. Press D so that it's D, you can cycle through your weapons, okay? So press D once or twice or three times, however, you take in order to select the A120C and then press 6 and you see a circle appear in your hut, a big, big circle. Everybody sees that? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's the flood mode, right? That, no, with the A120C is visual mode. You see that it yes, says visual. visual in the hut, okay? At the same time, your radar is working, but basically, if within 10 to whatever nautical miles, a bandit would be here, you, the, the AIM-120's ra um, onboard radar would automatically lock up on that on the target without him really knowing it until you launch, okay? So, you would see the two uh, red uh, launch uh, lights flash up, and uh, you could fire the missile without locking him up on the radar, understand? And now select, and you see that visual changes to flood. You see that it changes Sorry, in the radar MFD. Again, then. And what do we press? Uh, just D to to switch from aim on twenty C to aim seven. We're still in mode six. Yep. And uh, there you see that you're in flood mode, and, and the aim one seven will be guided without a lock tone, okay, on anything that is maneuvering within that circle within about, effectively, let's say, six to seven nautical miles. It's a very sneaky shot. For a time, there has been the bug that basically when you fired, they got the lock tone, but normally you shouldn't get a lock tone when you fire, so the bandit will be unaware of your locking, and you will fire a sneaky and very powerful uh, semi-active missile at him. Okay? Yep. Try for yourself, you know, make a little mission for yourself with a close bandit and try to get used and acquainted to those sub modes because for anything which is close, remember the piece of paper. Everything is, he just moves up 200 feet, he's outside of your radar, you can't lock him, and it's too much work at that range. Okay? So the sub modes help you there. If the bandit is too close, switch to your sub modes and help yourself out with that. Okay, should we try a maneuver? Yeah. Is everybody still fit? Is everybody, oh my god, that guy's talking that much? It's, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, everybody go back to spectators. And then 
how many are we? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's perfect. I want like three guys going to F fifteen C air. And three guys go into the F fifteen C aggressors. Make sure that you choose the same one, so Mitko, you, uh, you know the same numbers, otherwise you will not fly against each other. And OD, yeah. And now everybody quickly spawn, just for a test, if you set up against each other, if I fucked up. Yeah, that works. Okay, so now you will be away, everybody engage your radar, set up your aircraft, you're about 50 nautical miles from your bandit, which is straight ahead of you, um, which means that uh, set your radar at the distance, he's co-altitude, just to tell you for this mission, try to stay at 2500 uh, uh, feet at Angels 25. Try to keep your speed at around 350 to 400 knots, IAS. And once you're able, of course, turn on your radar, set it to 80 nautical miles. Go to TWS, select high PRF. And about now the bandit should be around 40 nautical miles for you. Switch him up, means lock him up. And now what I would like you to do is that you engage, let's say, a 50 degree right roll, right turn. And you will see that the bandit will slightly start coming off to our left side on the radar. Does everybody have that? I got nothing. Yep. So now he should be around 35, 33 miles. We switch the range to 40 and we move the TDC with the bandit, okay? And now he will be reaching the outer circle of the radar and here we will level out and we will keep him there. That's a full 59 degree gimbal lock, okay? The bandit that is looking at us, of course, is doing the same thing, so we have to adjust it or we lose lock. Yeah? It will be actually, sorry, I didn't think of it. Normally it should be so that one guy flies straight and the other cranks. That's easier at the beginning, but you're all great, so you'll, you'll be able to do it. So we keep him at that 59 degree lock, okay? It gives the bandit the impression that we're actually flying away from him. Uh, it might trick him into thinking that we don't care about him, that he's not our priority, because he probably thinks there's another uh, guy there. So, you know, people think that... Uh, those who are engaged most of the time fly straight to each other, okay? And uh, once we reach about 20 nautical miles, we then switch the PRF into medium and we start accelerating. You can put it to burner if you want, but you want to reach about 400 to 450 knots while still keeping him locked, okay? Change the range between below 20 nautical miles. Keep him locked at the gimbal. And now, in order to achieve that, you see you have to turn slightly towards him. We're about 50 nautical miles. And now you give full burn. And you see that the shoot cue, that little dot next to the target box, okay? Once you turn towards him, keep turning, keep turning. And pull about 3 to 4 Gs and that box is coming towards you and once it crosses the W nose indicator fire the missile and keep the turn okay that is a reverse gimbal shot and basically make sure that you don't over pull and the more you turn away from him the more loosen the stick so that you have less G's and you will see how much speed you pick up okay I'm already at about 600 knots and I can dive all the way to the ground reciprocal course 
and I can release chaff if I have an active missile um, uh, chasing me and uh, then basically when I have distance from the bandit I can start climbing again with 8 degrees climb which still leaves me enough speed to get away from the battle area and then once I reach 10,000 I can do a half octagonal roll that is rolling either over my right or left shoulder to climb back up to 20,000 feet or 25,000 feet and recommit on the bandit. Does everybody understand that maneuver? Basically it was two maneuvers in one. One was the full gimbal attack and shot with the reversed gimbal, that means I come from the full left to the full right side and the second part of the maneuver was the semi-split S defensive maneuver. Any questions? Nope. Okay. I was, I, I was AFK for a while. Is there a password? Can I hop in? It's Eagle. Thanks. Uh, Cobra, exit exit the aircraft. You want me to exit? Yeah, I want you to watch uh, the guys with me. Uh, Midco and Backspin, you can go back in. And we will do now that you guys engage each other. And I will look at two people. And Stooge will look at two people. And Cobra will look at two people and will comment on that. So we have six, six pilots total? Yeah, I'm quickly making some sub-channels. Is it going to be one-on-one -on -one training or what? One versus one, yeah. Alright. Okay, everybody join the aircraft spots, don't uh, spawn yet. We go on, yeah, we go on separate channels. Yeah. So, Stooge, uh, what, what we were just demonstrating or what we are trying to demonstrate is the standard gimbal crank maneuver, full gimbal. Uh, yep. Initiated soon, so both have to adjust it to keep the lock. Uh, keep the TDC over the, the bandit so that the range and the uh, altitude keeps adjusting with the bandit that helps not losing lock. And then at about 20 nautical miles switch to medium PRF, start accelerating. At 50 nautical miles start turning into the bandit. And then once the shoot cue passes the nose indicator, the W, you fire your M120 and you pull it through into a split S and defensive maneuver. Are there some restrictions to the fight, or is it just free? Stay at co altitude. It's not about shooting the other guy down. It's just about getting a feeling to do the cranking maneuver with the reverse shot, and followed by the semi-split as defensive evasive maneuver. Hey, what that guys are you? What guys are you giving, Luke? Okay, so we have Arclight and Nescafe. It's going to be Group A.
Okay, guys, did you understand what the basics? Yep. Don't go straight to the bandit. Uh, put uh, put the bandit on the the radar gimbal on the side of the radar. Ah, uh, yeah. The 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 spawn in count three to one, and then click fly, and then you start at the same time. Okay, guys. Yep. Put the bandit on the radar gimbal. Uh, Inside uh, 20, uh, 30, uh, 30 to 20, start accelerating. So when you reach uh, around um, 50 miles, will be at uh, above Mach 1. When you'll be in the missile range, okay, turn into the bandits, launch, start cranking, uh, defensive. Do you understand? Yeah, I think so. The the basic is don't go uh, don't go straight to the bandit. Put it on gimbal, and accelerate uh, before uh, launch missile. Just one question: Do you do you, uh, hard lock him or just uh, just lock in the once in this in uh, TWS mode? Uh, no, keep it keep it in uh, TWS and uh, with the uh, with the basic that uh, outside twenty miles will be. Uh, at IPRF, uh, inside 20, uh, change to medium PRF. Copy. You can you can uh, jump in the cockpits and uh, and uh, spawn. Okay, you are inside uh, around 40 miles. Yeah, just kind of 40. Maintain Angel 25 between tw uh, Angel 20 and 25. Yeah. And be careful uh, at the, the bandit's altitude, so because altitude is energy in this case. So never, uh, never be. Beneath the bandits, bandits uh, altitude angels. Uh, only if you are defensive or are trying to to defeat uh, the missiles. Roger. Okay, thirty thirty miles. Uh, accelerate. With every time the put the with every time the bandit on the the gimbal inside twenty miles to fifty miles, turn into bandit launch and go uh, uh, after uh, and uh, continue the the maneuver until uh, missile went active and uh, after active uh, uh, go uh, defensive split ends uh, crank. Uh, Can you on the launch, launch on the, the Bennett? Okay, crank, crank, crank. More aggressive, uh, more aggressive. Descend, uh, because uh, uh, descend at the same time that you that you are cranking, 
descend, descend, and the descend go like thirty degrees, thirty de oh, like thirty degrees. Not hit. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> When you when you launch, yeah. Uh, when you launch and I, you you went defensive, um, automatically uh, automatically descend and descend to gain um, to gain um, velocity, um, and at at um, at the same time that you are gaining um, velocity, uh, you are putting uh, yourself on the notch of the missile against the against the floor okay and um, all shots inside uh, 10 miles uh, to 10 to to 7 miles will be very very dangerous you almost have no time to to um, to defeat the missile so you have to launch and uh, automatically after launch it went defensive and the better maneuver in that case will be a drastic one and like a split defensive against against the directly fox fox three by the book at uh, go defensive immediately orthogonal roll uh, Use the steering dot. Use the steering dot at the side and put the steering dot in the side of the edit display. I, I'm it. Still flying. Yeah, but I, I'm going now. <laughs> yeah, good job. Right, yeah, I keep forgetting to put that little dot round on you. That's what it is. Um, use the use the steering dot. I'm already in there. Uh, you uh, after uh, after shot. Uh, use the steering dot. Uh, uh, to so you have um, a, a, um, an indicator uh, for the crank. Uh, when you are entering the orthogonal roll and uh, put the missile on the on your three or nine o'clock and if you still uh, want to maintain uh, track of the bandits uh, you use the you must use the steering dot and put the steering dot at the point that dot in the end of the display put uh, put uh, the dot uh, on the side of the end of the display and you must know that uh, uh, if you um, put the the dot uh, outside of uh, add up display, you will you will uh, lose lock. You, do you understand? I think so. Yeah. Uh, put the uh, when the, uh, you enter defensive, put the dot on the side on the side of the of the add up display. And maintain uh, uh, like uh, four hundred uh, four uh, four hundred to five hundred knots. Yeah. But yeah, but four hundred it's uh, four hundred and fifty it's, uh, it's enough, and uh, turn as much as you can. Okay, should we try it again then? And that is a crank maneuver. Uh, put the the track the tracking bandit on the gimbal. Use the indicate the steering steering dot indication to uh, to crank at the same time that we are uh, tracking the bandits and guiding the missiles at the same time we are uh, defending and uh, defeating uh, dynamically and synthetically the missile okay are you in the air i'm losing you i lose you i am now sorry yeah Okay, uh, Dolly. Don't forget to change to medium PRF inside 20 miles. 
At 50 miles, turn to the bandit and launch at uh, like 14 to 12. I'm turning in two, 12 miles, Fox 3. Immediately, I'm defending. I'm going down. Use, put the dot, put the dot. At the same time, you make an orthogonal roll. Put the dot on the side of the adapter spy. Never stop turning. Climb, 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 climb. Hit. And it seems I defeat the missile. Yeah, I, I, lo I launch. I launch slightly before you. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Uh, maybe that uh, had some importance. I launched like uh, one second before. Let's go again. Yep. Don't go uh, immediately to um, to STT because really you will uh, want the uh, benefit. Okay. That you are uh, offensive. Okay, you can go go ahead to the bandit until uh, 30, 30 miles. Use the uh, you use the cues on the end of display so you see the range. When you enter, after you enter maximum range, uh, okay, there, uh, there you can uh, put the, um, the bandit on gimbal, rather gimbal. Like 35, 33 miles. Roger. Okay, I'm 27 miles and maximum range. Okay, I'm putting you on gimbal. I'm accelerating already. Twenty miles. Medium PRF. Roger. Uh, with medium PRF, as uh, Alex uh, said, it's it's harder to lose uh, lock on the bandit, even if the bandit tra is trying to notch. Fifty miles, turning to you. Thirty miles. Twelve miles, Fox Three. Fox Three. I'm sp I'm uh, turning. Uh, I'm descending, descending, and orthogonal roll. Cranking now, climbing, and it. No drop. Defeated. Let's go again.
we, uh, after this, well, of course, uh, it's uh, here, here we are uh, one versus one, two versus two, uh, mainly uh, the difference is, is because is uh, that uh, yeah the the objective in two two versus two will it, it will be to split the band and engage uh, engage uh, one after one after uh, the another or uh, if you want or you, you can turn uh, two uh, two versus two uh, two uh, one one versus one we can uh, you can uh, uh, try to sneak beneath, like to uh, go for a roll, and try and beneath and um, uh, go beneath the. Um, try to enter beneath the rider, the rider of the um, the bandit. At the same time, as we can launch, uh, we can make the um, and uh, Brian that you can launch earlier. So so we put the bandit on defensive and engage engage uh, after that. Are you understanding? Launch earlier, put bandit on defensive, and uh, at the same time we we are uh, on the on the uh, on the offensive. Twenty-two miles, change to medium. Copy. Starting. Uh, are you dropping tanks? Uh, negative. Okay, drop tanks. Done. Uh, w um, I should already uh, say that. Uh, in the merge like this, uh, uh, when you you are certain certain that uh, w w you will be in the merge, uh, drop tanks uh, before uh, before 20 miles. Fox three, Fox three, and launch Fox three again. Defensive. Without drop tanks, we can we can defend. And it can be a, a difference. Can be a difference too. Okay, it seems we survived the the same. The it seems we we survived the. We are too close. Um, let's let's jump again. Yep. Let's let's uh, let's make a variant now. I'm not sure if uh, let's make um, a variant. I'm not sure if it's if it is uh, what Alex wants, but let's go for um, you. And you, I think you you already understand the um, the basics of the merge. Let's let's do a variant and inside 40 miles start to uh, go for a uh, accelerate, go burn burn and enter uh, like a, a 30 degrees climb, maintain. 350 knots. Okay. 30 and let, yeah, and 30 let's go. Uh, the the higher you'll be, the the long range you can launch a missile. More energy. Okay, so uh, below 40 miles, accelerate and pitch up 30 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. You can be like lower if you want, but uh, for uh, f uh, to preserve well the um, the economic uh, 80 will be around uh, angels 20 to angels 25. Well, angels 20 or angels 25 to angels 30, but uh, at those uh, those angels will be marking, and that's not uh, that's not good. But uh, maintain like uh, angels 20 to 25 inside 40 miles climb to uh, like angels 40 above controls. Ok, 
Okay, is that you off my nose, uh, 30 miles? I, if I uh, look at the, the angels, I'm angels 35, you are at angels uh, 30. Yeah. Uh, and uh, be careful because at this, uh, don't go, don't go straight ahead. Put me on gimbal. Uh, be, ca be careful at this uh, drop tanks, drop tanks. At this altitude, uh, uh, maneuvering will be more difficult, more difficult. And missiles will be more faster. Yeah, it's dangerous. It, it, yeah, it is dangerous to be at this, uh, this, uh, this angels. We can launch longer but uh, we, we will be with uh, difficult uh, maneuvering uh, to defeat the missiles okay 50 miles I turn into the bandit and launch when the one ready turn into you fox 3 12 miles defend fox defend three. and go for a split S. Go, go for a split S. turn turn uh, to the opposite direction and descend and uh, maintain and uh, 60 degrees uh, the dive 60 degrees and land. Okay, the missile on Australia me turning to you climb. Climb. As, as climbing will will be defeating and already and, and, and recommit will not be engaging but recommit until you will be finding me. One, uh, one important, okay, I think I saw you, maybe. Um, one important thing is when you you are engaging, uh, memorize the, the reference. So oh, you, I yeah, I, I didn't learn that also. <laughs> I don't, I'm not, I don't know wh where you are. Um, when you are merging, uh, and launch a missile and uh, take a snapshot on the the reference, the heading you are, so you can recommit uh, in a faster a faster way. Copy that. How is it going with you guys? Yeah, good, I think. You understand the principle: full cranking, full gimbal maneuver, the reverse. Yeah, I think I got it. Or yeah. getting it? Yeah. yeah. The split S afterwards, the defensive maneuver. Yeah, I've just done the split S. Good, good. Arc light, it's good for you. I oh, still yeah. AFK. Yeah, it's uh, with the other still, yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, arc light, uh, jump into. Jump into. Jump into a, a cockpit and do. And uh, try we, uh, what uh, we are um, talking. Go ahead, make an engagement, and I'll watch Nescafe. Sorry, what do you want me to do now? Uh, make jump an engagement. in. Yeah, yeah, jump into, jump into the slot. Arc light. Arc light. Thirty, thirty miles. Uh, put uh, bandit on the gimbal. Uh, accelerate, uh, accelerate inside. Uh, 30 to 20 miles, uh, more than Mach 1, uh, at 20 miles change to medium PRF, uh, start turning to the bandit inside 50 miles, launch when ready, automatically after launch go defensive with an uh, crank or uh, if you are close, closer and uh, you have an uh, incoming missile, go for an orthogonal roll. Missile perpendicular to you, free at nine o'clock, and went in the roll, defeat the missile. Before that, uh, that was uh, that what that I was talking with uh, Nescafe. In the merge, uh, memorize the uh, memorize the reference. So when you are recommitting, you know already the the adding to the the reference to the bandit. Yeah, very good. Okay, let's have a look. 
Arclight is in a nice cranking turn. Nescafe is adjusting. Looks very good. Don't forget to drop tanks at uh, 20 miles. Copy. After you drop tanks at 20, at uh, 50 miles, after you launch and went defensive, you, you will be maneuvering uh, better without uh, drop tanks. Accelerate to... Uh, 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 go full burner inside 20 miles. So when you are launching, we, we, you are at uh, high velocity and you will, you will have more energy to, to spend in the defensive maneuver. Don't burn all the way there, Nescafe, you know, you have still time. You're just rushing into the fight. The longer you take, you know, it's important that you start accelerating around 20 nautical miles. That gives you enough time to come up to speed for a successful defensive maneuver. In the meantime, lay back and chill. Let the opponent do the mistake. Let him reveal his battle plan, you know. The quicker you <laughs> rush into the fight, the less other possibilities arise. Okay. So cut those burners until you come to 20 and pickle those tanks. At 20 nautical miles, then start increasingly accelerating into him, you know. You also do not want to be too fast because then the pull into the split ass will be more difficult if you have too much speed. So once you're at 20 nautical miles, start accelerating more and more and more so that you pick up your fullest speed from going from 15 on and you end up between 500, around 500 is a good corner speed for pulling that um, up a bit too late of course I was talking <laughs> yeah, now I lost everything. him on the radar I don't, okay. think I, I, I don't think I had it in medium well done Arclight um, good job ah, I just wanted to see how it is this Try it again. Uh, split us. Yeah, let's do it again. And I was talking into it, of course, you know, but uh, you know what I was telling you, right? Yeah. So don't rush into the fight, guys. You have time to accelerate in within 10 nautical miles. The F-15 can reach all the speed you need. All right, I'll leave you with Cobra again. Copy. And uh, I'll go back down to backspin, make one or two more engagements and then we'll meet up everybody. Roger. Okay guys, go and go for the basics. Uh, 40 miles uh, inside 30 miles when the when the missile queue will enter ra uh, maximum range enter when entering maximum range put uh, the bandit on the radar gimbal. At 20 miles, accelerate, uh, drop tanks. At 50 miles, turn into uh, at 50 miles when you are at uh, the optimum range to launch, turn into bandit launch m immediately. You went uh, defensive with an orthogonal roll, crank maneuver, or uh, if if you are like uh, very very close, well, well, very very close, it's uh, the only the only chance it's go it's for an orthogonal roll. If you are like inside 10 miles, yeah, you can go for a speed defensive, but uh, go uh, like in with an uh, with a dive to accelerate and don't forget to at the, when you are launching, uh, take the reference, look at look uh, what uh, what's your reference, what's your direction. So when you are recommitting, you know the direction. Copy. Until uh, from 30 to, to 20, uh, you don't need to, to burn. At 30 to 25, uh, uh, 
you can start burning at uh, 20 miles don't uh, forget to change to medium prf drop tanks you are in a merge 50 miles then you turn into 50 miles turn into bandit launch defensive and defensive go for a, for a crank uh, on the, or an orthogonal roll if you are closer and you have the missile tracking you Twenty miles, median, drop tanks. Medium pure after drop tanks at twenty miles. Copy. And that's all right, burn. At fifty miles, turn into the bandit. Fifty miles turn to the bandit and launch uh, when the steering uh, dot uh, it's in the middle of the, the circle and uh, immediately uh, it, um, roll and descend roll descend after launch you will be continuing turning and uh, roll and descend with a crank put the put the steering dot on the the side of the adapt display fox ray okay roll this end roll this end roll this end orthogonal roll orthogonal roll turn roll turn 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 push 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 no it yeah you launch you launch um earlier than you like uh, five seconds earlier when you uh, uh, when you launched uh, you you have uh, you had already the missile uh, very close to you okay and you try again yeah 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 go ahead go ahead don't wait uh, don't wait for a uh, 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 don't wait to uh, uh, arc light. Uh, please go to the. Please uh, like uh, jump into again into the into the plane so you you will be at distance. Uh, don't uh, don't wait uh, until too late to launch. Inside uh, 15 to to 12 miles you can launch. Copy. Like 14 miles it will be more than enough and very dangerous. Thirty to thirty uh, to look at the um, the head up display at the missiles range. When the missile, when the the range will be entering maximum range, put bandit on the gimbal. Inside twenty miles, drop tanks, accelerate. Change to medium PRF. If you want. Inside 50 miles, uh, turn into STT. But it's not. It's, we we are using uh, sparrows. It's not uh, sparrow. Not sparrows. We are using uh, Amrams. It's not that important. 20 miles, medium PRF, drop tanks. 50 miles, turn into the band. Of course, you can go aggressive, like turning to the bandit uh, earlier, but the, uh, be sure you will be with uh, enough energy or velocity if you want. Drop tanks at uh, and change to medium PRF at uh, 20 miles and that's alright. And turn into the bandit. When we, uh, so, when you are turning to the bandit, you will be. Uh, already at uh, uh, opt optimum range, like 50 miles or less. Uh, immediately after steering dot is in, this, in the center launch, launch immediately, and they uh, go defensive already immediately. Don't lose, uh, don't lose uh, time. Fox three. 
Go defensive, go defensive. You were already a missile in the air. And um, you must anticipate a shot. So. Uh, hey guys, conclude. Come in the lobby. Okay, the missiles from what I'm seeing, they're not uh, going to to shoot anybody. But uh, it's important, very important, to anticipate the, what the what the, what the bandit is doing. Uh, we must anticipate the shot. So be, when we are turning, we will be already sinking in the turning to defensive. So we launch. When ready, when the dot is in the the inner the the middle of the circle, we launch and uh, we can launch a second missile like uh, three to four seconds after, but we must uh, wait immediately within a sharp turn like a speed test and uh, in a dive or an orthogonal roll if we are very very close with the already missile tracking us. Okay, guys, let, let's go, let's go above so we are uh, we will be hearing what. Uh, what those guys are uh, are talking? Yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, what I've seen, um, some uh, Louis and, and Thomas will then also maybe go into detail for for each group. Uh, Sheriff, sorry, you arrived late. Um, we're basically at the end of the training, but maybe you pick up something. Uh, we will repeat these things in the future every two months or something we will offer uh, public trainings uh, if possible even more um, so uh, n uh, no actually two hours ago 1900 Zulu no no worries sheriff man you'll be from the beginning the next time okay okay what I've seen guys uh, I've seen a very nice developed uh, cranking maneuver I, th I, I hope that you got the basics of this um, the benefits of the maneuver, of course, are that you're at the same time in an offensive and defensive position or basically at the verge of going defensive at the moment that you fire, which, of course, is way better than if you have to fly towards the bandit. If you have semi-active engagements, there are other maneuvers, snaking maneuvers, uh, beaming maneuvers, notch maneuvers, whatever to stay on bandit, trashing missiles head on. That's all next level shit, okay? For the time being, it's good to understand that with the F-15C, I have the possibility, A, to bug more guys, and B, be in TWS, which means that he doesn't get an STT lock warning, okay? He doesn't know you're locking him. He has the impression you're flying away. You are taking more time to build up your own fight, okay? Don't rush into the fight. Don't burn into the fight. Take yourself time, okay, if you lock and crank a target early enough, you have time to think about how you're going to do that. You have time to prepare yourself. And it's important, you know, even after these years, if I don't do it, you've seen it when I was flying against Backspin and I was explaining what I was doing. He shot me down because my concentration was actually away from what I was really doing, but from telling you guys what I was doing. So, so he won, okay. Even I, even Stooge, we have to repeat in our mind before we go into a fight, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do this. And this is, it, is, it is nice, for example, with backspin that he always said what he was doing out loud. That helps your wingman and that helps yourself in developing and memorizing and routinizing a workflow. And air-to-air -air engagements are always about a certain workflow that you set up for yourself before you enter the engagement, okay? That sounds super tremendously complicated, but basically it is really going to an engagement, finding the one thing where you say like, nope, that was not the right thing, or oh, I lost lock, and then what do I have to do next time to keep the lock? Uh, so this I fired too early, <laughs> oof, I fired too late, oof, I went into the defensive too late and stuff. And the more and more you refine your workflow and how to go into an air-to-air -air engagement, and the more precise you are about everything you do, okay, how much Gs you pull, how you perfectionate that split-ass maneuver to get away quickly from him, but also not lose speed while I'm turning, not over-pulling it, and then interpreting, is that missile behind me still dangerous? Can I already turn back? And stuff like that, okay? That's all. The more precision and the more discipline you take in all these small aspects of your workflow, the more successful will be the overall engagement. I know it's been a lot, even if it's been little, it's been a lot today. 
I hope it wasn't too much, and I hope you 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 take something from that, and and that it will help you on the server and and understanding how principally F15 engagements work. Just to recapitulate, the F15 likes it high, okay? Um, when you dive low and the radar dives below the bandit, it actually helps you lock, keeping the lock, because radars, they like to look up, and um, missiles, they like to accelerate down. So always try to shoot from a higher position and then dive below the bandit, which in the split S, you know, you have that half defensive and half offensive maneuver at the same time works always in your favor. Um, secondly, uh, be aware of the Gs that you're pulling, be aware of the speed that you're having, you know. Fastest is not always best. There is a moment where you want to be fast, but you don't want to be too fast. And then there is the moment where you want to be super fast and you don't want to pull too much. So be attention pay attention to how you are actually flying keep your altitudes train yourself in pulling a constant 3.5 g's 360 degrees in that direction and 360 degrees in the other direction these are things you can train on your own and they will help you performing these maneuvers every other tactic that we use in the f15 okay be it with two three four pilots uh, different versions of the cranking maneuver a skating maneuver or whatever they are all based on that principal cranking maneuver full gimbal to reverse gimbal shot the shoot cue on the nose shot and the split as defensive maneuver because if you do it high you know sometimes a guy from zero will fire his et to twenty thousand and if i have enough speed i will not dive into the missile but i will rather do an immelman than a split s in fact it's just the reverse thing only that there you have to be even more careful how much speed you have at the end and that you're not sitting duck in the sky. But uh, basically this is the basic maneuver from out which you in the future will be able to develop many adaptations according to, to different situations. And today for the training we were soft, we fired at around 10 nautical miles since a lot of experienced pilots exactly know when they see you're an F-15 and you behave like that they know what you're doing, okay? So a 10 nautical mile shot is way too far. That means train yourself in pushing the edge. How can I reverse that crank later, a bit later, and even a bit later to fire closer, closer, and closer? And how can I interpret, you know, is the bandit really paying attention to me? Is he fighting me? Or is he fighting somebody else? You know, then I, of course I can push closer and nose on on him and whatever, you know? But that's also how to interpret what the bandit is doing helps you in assessing how close can I reverse that cranking maneuver and get the shaft shot off the rail. If the bandit is not paying attention to you, then go to four miles and right in the face. <laughs> that's the way to do With it. With a gun. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not. Then the gun. After. Yeah, because the gun doesn't work at the moment. Well, it works. Yeah, the... the I think it's uh, bug, still bug, in the F-15, because I was oh. trying to shoot a, a MiG-21 in the in cl not close range. Nearly its uh, tailpipe was in my windshield. Hmm. I was making some test if it's working or not, but still it's losing. Sometimes if you're a little bit off and too close, you don't hit, you know? If you're too close, then you might miss completely because of how the gun yeah. is placed to the side. Yeah. But be that how it may, okay? Um, are there any questions? Yeah, when are you going to run the next uh, lesson? Um, <laughs> probably somewhere around October, beginning of October, end of September, around something like that. Okay, that's good. Was was it okay for you guys? It's just for us. It's it's good to have a feedback. You know, is it too much talking? Is it too much flying? Is it too much information? Is it? Uh, how how was it for you guys? It was very good, thank you. Yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how can there Glad. be too much flying? I never understand that. <laughs> yeah, that, that was that was the question to see who's who didn't get what it's all about. <laughs> No, they're all on the green side. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed it, okay, and I hope it, it, it helps you flying the F-15. It is, it is a beautiful aircraft, it is strong, it is fast, it is, you know, it loves high altitudes. If you have AWACS support, if you have a lot of buddies, you know, don't be shy of contrailing, fly it around 32,000 feet. That's its altitude, the Eagle likes it high, and we come, we come, we come down on people fast and hard, and we smack them with that, okay? That's that's our advantage, and you see how how much speed it can pick up, how much cheese it can pull at the same time. It's sturdy, it's a stable aircraft, and it's a very rea reliable thing, you know. And if you if you if you learn it, and if you get used to it, you know, it's it's just the most beautiful thing. Uh, and you see, if you want to fly it at a high level, even if it's a Flaming Cliffs three aircraft, and of course it will be more complicated when you have to switch the buttons. But you still have to press a lot of buttons on your hotter, so there is no difference, okay, if you switch a switch in the cockpit or on the keyboard or on the hotters, or if it's a Warthog or if it's a Logitech 3D. If you have the correct workflow, if you know your numbers, okay, and if you follow it through correctly, you will be the pilot who wins, not the other guy who has fancy switches and gear, right? So, so this is the thing, it's all about workflow and routine. And the more you repeat these things, you know, the more creative you will start getting and the higher will be your pilot skill. Okay, the next training we want to do will probably be air-to-air -air refueling. Oh, yes. <laughs> and oh, there yeah. is a reason for that because we plan something big for this year, something extraordinary. And it has a lot to do with realism with real ATCs and a battle scenario that is much more coordinated than what the community knows. Um, hint, red flag, hint. Uh, not not saying too much, but there will be certain skills demanded. This is also why we offer the public training, is for those people who would like to participate in events to have a guidance to be able. It's much better for us and for you if you know what you're doing up there if you can work with other people, you know, and if you work in a team, then if you come just as a lone wolf and you have no clue, and for you it's much more joy. So we will speak more about that in the future, and I hope you will be present at the next uh, training, and I think that's it from my side. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for showing up. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, if you have further questions, okay, that arise in the time, you can always post on the one of fourth forums. But post there because I will just keep it in that thread, and then people who come later they can also see what we have worked on and stuff.